Without anything further, let us begin. All right, first a little note on the power of home. A person travels the world over in search of what they need and they return home to find it. I don't know why I included that, but I felt like it. Maybe on a funnier, lighter note, uh, data is the new bacon. Kind of like that, data is the new bacon. In other words, it's something that everybody loves. It's universal. Oops. And then lastly, um, as, as you guys have seen, uh, here we are, we're drowning in information, but we're still starving for wisdom. So I hope to uh, give you guys just a little bit of wisdom today. We have some overarching trends, um, and I wanna just discuss that with you briefly. First, buyer activity is strong. Um, sort of last year, it was ridiculously strong. First half of this year, it was still ridiculously strong. Um, it's still strong. Maybe not as strong as it was a year ago, but it is still um, historically strong. Um, it looks like this year will surpass um, last year's, at least we're on track year to date. We have to see how the second half of the year um, shapes up. So not a guarantee, but it looks like we could. Seller activity, right? Sellers didn't really come to the market last year. They were thinking, where am I gonna go if I sell my home? Um, so this year we've had some signs of recovery on the supply side, but we still have a lot of work to do. Um, of course, that means if, if, if buyers are purchasing a lot and sellers aren't listing a lot, of course, that means that inventory is the biggest factor um, holding back sales and frustrating buyers. So thus, the market is sort of bonkers, right? Home selling in record time, at record high prices, and often for over, uh, for over list price. So just a little bit of perspective again here before we begin, um, just kind of staying on this. Um, let's talk a little bit before we dive into some charts. I just wanted to, uh, I just want to share a few, a few of these observations with you guys. So we've gone from, and by the way, I think this is from NAR. I believe this is from Chief Economist Lawrence Yoon. Um, so we've gone from 150 miles per hour down to 120 miles an hour, right? So that's called deceleration. It's not a slowdown, right? We're not in reverse. We're not even slowing down. Instead of adding 10 miles per hour, right? Every five seconds, we're adding two miles per hour every five seconds. So we're still accelerating, right? We're still going down the road, down the highway. We're not applying the brakes, right? And we're not in reverse. It's just, there's a little difference uh, in the pace. So, and let's also not forget a lot of the demand from last summer was, um, it's what we like to say, it was displaced, right? A lot of that demand was displaced or pulled in to 2020 or first or second quarter of 2021. I had FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. And so I had to pull the trigger on something. Rates were good. We were in the middle of the great COVID shuffle, right? Where everyone wanted more space and to control their own HVAC filtration mechanism. Um, so meaning, right, what appears to be a slowdown in the data now is mostly reflecting sort of uniquely strong baseline activity, if you will, uh, from last year. In other words, today looks slower, but that's compared to a very hot market last year. Guys, the vast majority of, of trusted analysts and economists just aren't forecasting a crash. Um, they're just not. A few other thoughts while we're just kind of geeking out with some words here. Um, seller activity is up, but that's compared to a low or suppressed baseline year. Again, sales are lower because sales were so strong last year. Listings are higher because listings were so slow last year because I didn't want potentially sick people touring my home, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and then of course we just discussed number two. So buyer activity is down, but that's compared to, right? compared to a very strong baseline and because some of the demand from this month, I should say from July, was pulled into say, you know, April, May, June uh, of this year. Prices are up, but that's partly because of more million plus product selling. But someone asked, could we soon see lower quality homes on the market that really would only sell in this hot market? And they would likely bypass inspection. So I thought that was an interesting thought. Um, and I think that's a possibility. 
All right, so a few more words here before we go into some charts. I know you guys are excited about charts, I am too. Here's a Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard. Um, conditions are different than in the early 2000s, right? Particularly in terms of credit. The current climb in home prices instead reflects strong demand amid tight supply. Here's uh, uh, Mr. Karp, chief economist at BBVA. I think they're a financial firm. Underwriting standards are still strong, so there's little risk of a bubble, bubble developing. Bill McBride of Calculated Risk, one of my favorite um, sort of econ blogs that I follow, um, you know, it's just not clear to me that things are going to slow down significantly in the near term. In 05, right, he had a strong sense that the hot market would turn. Today, he doesn't have that sense at all. All right, that one's a little softer, but he was one of the few ones uh, who did predict the crash um, in the last cycle. Mark Fleming, a first American, right, looking back at the bubble years, home prices exceeded home buying power. Today, house buying power is nearly twice as high as the median sales price. So the gap between home buying power and sales price indicates there's still room for further price growth. I know some of you will be surprised to, to hear that. All right, this is national. So this is from NAR. Average number of offers received on the most, uh, on the most recent closed sale. So this is going back to December of 2017. And what do you guys see? All right, two and a half offers. Oh, okay, hey, we're headed up to three. Wow, almost five offers. Um, five offers on average, right, per each closed sale. Now, the market's been hot since 2017, and that's why we see at least two, well, pretty much at least two, suddenly that became five. Um, so something changed there. Uh, let's see. Existing home sales at a seasonally adjusted annualized rate. This is again from NAR. Um, you guys can see, uh, look at what happened uh, during the COVID time. You guys can see that existing home sales fell, but recovered pretty quickly. And then we saw this surge. And then maybe we kind of came back to maybe more normal levels. Here's what's interesting. Check out my little trend line I just put in. So this is kind of the trend. We've been, we had a little V below trend. We had an inverted V above trend. Um, it doesn't mean this trend is broken. It just means we were a little bit below trend, a little bit above trend. Maybe now we go back on trend, if that makes sense. That was a lot of trends, but it's a trendy thing to say. Anyway. All right, guys, the market. Let's talk about some of our short-term trends. More trends. Very trendy. Okay. Daily showing activity. So this is one of our favorites. It, of course, shows... Um, showing activity um, using this rolling, week, rolling weekly average. The beauty is it allows us to compare the uh, this year compared to 2019 and 20. And you can really see the COVID impact. You can see that signature right here, right? So March showing activity went down, but then it came right back up. And sure enough, it was actually hovering well above 2019 levels for some time, right? So that was happening for some time. Uh, and then you can see 2021, that trend continued. Uh, sure enough, uh, showing activity this year has been remarkably strong. In fact, even higher than most of uh, 2020. Uh, but once 2020 kind of came back, again, a lot of that demand from this year was pulled earlier into either this year or some of that demand from this summer was pulled into perhaps later last year. So we do see showings down just a bit. However, here's what's important, guys we're basically back on track with 2019. 2020 was an exceptional year, the COVID shuffle, right? Interest rates, FOMO, everything else. So now um, the uh, current, current day showing activity is basically back on trend with 2019 levels. And I think that's, that's a good thing. That's, a, that's an okay thing. Okay, so activity, showing activity by price point. Um, you know, I like to show this just because of the numbers, um, but I, I like to focus in on the share. So let's go over, let's skip over to the share. So this, um, this shows us what percentage of overall showing activity occurred in um, this segment under 200,000. Um, what percentage of our overall showings occurred in this segment over a million. So be careful here because 2020 was such an exceptional year. And as we get later this year, I think we'll go back to 2020 comparisons, but for now we're still looking back to 2019. As you guys saw, right? 
we're basically showing activity is basically back on 2019 trend, right? It's back on those, uh, it's back on a par with 2019. So it makes sense to compare that. Looking at activity by price point, we see far less activity in our most um, affordable range, uh, sub 200K. Almost 30%, right? 30 out of every 100 showings two years ago, 30 out of every 100 showings occurred on listings under 200. Nowadays, it's 18 out of every 100 showings occur on a product under 200,000. You guys can see how things change, you know, all the way up the price continuum uh, up to a million plus. Where let's see, one point, call it 1.25, doubling would be 2.5. So we've almost doubled, right? The share of showings on, or, uh, on listings at or above a million dollars has nearly doubled in two years. Uh, pretty remarkable. All right, so just looking at the change, there you go, almost up 100%, which would be doubling. Um, so it's up 91%. We see these losses in our most affordable segments, everything under 250. It's nice to see some of these gains in what you might call our, um, you know, our, our mid-tier, you know, mid-level markets. Uh, well, three, three to four hundred thousand is definitely now a, a, a first-time home buyer segment, a more affordable or entry-level segment. You know, I think four to six is kind of that move-up segment. I think for most people, obviously, it depends. Um, but you know, again, in our luxury segment, we see pretty significant gain in uh, in showing activity. Okay, new listings. We're going to look at the 2021 uh, trend in seller activity. And we are going to compare that against the prior three years. So we've got 2018, 19, 20, and 21. Oops. Okay, so uh, taking a look at 2021 here, uh, seller activity, new listings. It's been okay. Um, it's been okay. At least we're in the mix uh, with the prior three years, but do check out um, do check out 2020. Right, so seller activity was going pretty well, uh, and then enter COVID last year, uh, middle end of March. You guys can see what happened with seller activity, but then look at what happened last year. Right, sellers were actually feeling a little bit better. Of course, buyers absorbed all that off the market, so it never really ended up in inventory because demand was so strong. But again, you know, here in 21, some people think seller activity has skyrocketed and buyer activity has plummeted. And that's just not consistent with the data. That's not what the data is telling us. All right, so seller activity. And now let's pivot over to uh, buyer activity. So pending sales in the Metro using our same rolling weekly average. 2020, look at the hit we took after COVID. We got right back on track and then, wow, did we have a banner year last year, right? Demand, 2020, well above 2018 and 19. So here we are in 21 and you know, first half of this year was actually really strong. Um, shouldn't say actually really strong. You guys know it was really strong. It was definitely really strong, um, not surprisingly. So you guys can see 2021 here in, uh, in black used to be ahead of the prior three years. Now it's more like it's, it's a little bit more in line uh, with the, I guess, 2018 and 19, because we know that 2020 was an exceptional year. And some of the, um, some of the time that we lost here, right, we more than made up for here. Change in new listings by price range, uh, July of this year compared to two years ago. Seller activity falling anywhere under 250. We have fewer new listings entering. You get up between half a million and three quarters of a million, and now you've got 50% more seller activity uh, compared to two years ago. Overall, it's about four, four and a half percent uh, more new listings, uh, even a million plus, up almost a quarter. Uh, shifting over to the demand side, right? Similarly, if we, can't, if we can't list the product, buyers can't buy the product, right? They can't write offers on that product. So sure enough, we saw demand fall in our, um, in our sub a quarter million ranges, anything under that 250 mark. It looks like we see our biggest gainer in demand in this three quarters of a million up to a million, followed by half a million up to three quarters of a million. And then of course, uh, our, our friends in our lofty uh, million plus market. Overall, 6% over two years. So I wanna bring this one back. This one looks at the change in new listings in gray. 
and the change in pending sales in blue. So within each range, right, so these kind of white grid lines sort of um, separate the price ranges. So just kind of look within these grid lines. And what we're seeing is, so growth in seller activity in gray, uh, growth in buyer activity in blue. Supply growth in gray, demand growth in blue. I see demand growth outpacing supply growth in pretty much every segment, at least every segment that's positive, with one interesting exception. And this was actually a, a, a more recent development. So interestingly, actually, new listings are growing faster than pending sales in this 250 to 350 uh, range, which is interesting and is a new trend. Um, doesn't really worry me because there's so much demand. Um, our median sales price is more or less in this bracket, in this range. And so there's so much demand there that you could see this as a positive, right? We could see demand rise because finally there's the listings to write offers on. Um, so something to, something to watch either way. Okay, let's pivot into some of our longer term trends, uh, if you will. So July new listings, this is every July going back to 2003. You guys can see we used to have over 10,000 new listings in 04, quite a few, uh, quite a few. Uh, now about 8,200 and you guys can see we've been on the rise. Um, we're up about 1.7%. I think we'd still like to see a little bit more given where our demand is, but um, you know, just for this indicator in July, I think that's a fine number. How about pending? So this is where things get interesting, you guys. Looking at July pendings. So here you see this pie in the sky, right? Here you see this 12.5% bump. Was it sustainable, right? Do we have the inventory to continue to push, you know, signed contracts, uh, pending sales, sales higher? Um, I guess the answer is no. Because we saw, um, we saw demand coming back down to earth. It did not crash. Let me repeat, pending sales did not crater. It did not crash. It did come down 11%. But just like we said, you guys, that is from a high, uh, I should say that's from an elevated baseline. Look at how elevated our baseline is. Of course, it's going to look like we fell relative to that. But it's comparing apples and oranges or pineapple and dragon fruit, right? Whatever your favorite fruit analogy. So what's encouraging to me is the fact that 6235 is still above the 6218, not by much but it is still above, meaning we are still on an upward trend, right? We're still in, in a positive cycle. It just means that this was a wonky month of a wonky year, right? So people look at this minus 11% and they say, oh my God, the sky is falling, right? Maybe I should change, maybe I should change careers. My goodness, no. Um, it only appears extreme relative to um, sort of a skewed baseline. So I hope that makes sense for you guys, because I know that some folks in the media, national and local, and I don't really care if you're a CNN or a Fox News person, you're going to see these figures down 10, down 11%. And, and the tendency is to go, oh my God, this is the end of it for the market. And it, it, it's just not true. Um, it's just not rooted in fact. So closed sales, we saw a similar trend down four and a half percent. But 6750, right, that's above 6700 from two years ago. Our title folks and our, our closers were busy, right? They saw, they saw all these pending sales, right, hit the closing table. Well, not all of them. Sometimes there's a 30, 60 day lag. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it came down a little bit from that elevated baseline. So I, I really need you guys to understand that and, and appreciate that. And I know it's a little complex, but I know you guys are up to it. So July market times, median days on market. How did we uh, how did we fare last month? About a week, right? A week on market. Seven days as a median. Half of our deals took over seven days to go under contract. The other half um, uh, had accepted purchase agreements in under seven days or in fewer than seven days. What a far cry from a hundred days on market, right? Only what thirteen short years ago. Pretty remarkable and uh, home selling 60% quicker uh, in 60% fewer days than last July. We shaved off 10 days, right? We shaved off a week and a half from our market times. Pretty remarkable. You know, we're going to skip original list price. Let's do um, 
median sold price, uh, median sales price. So up about 12% uh, to land us at 350. That's a strong number. You guys can see uh, 12% higher than 10, uh, not quite 16 that we saw in 2013 as we were getting out of you know, our, our housing crash, our great recession and our mortgage and foreclosure crisis. Because we know that we have an inventory shortage, a lot of folks are turning to new construction in the suburbs. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, with more telework and remote work and telecommuting, maybe right, maybe we don't all have to be as close in as, um, as we thought. There's still a lot of value to living close in. I think the cities are still doing really well. In fact, I know they are. The data supports that. Um, and as we get back to normal, I think all the cultural events, the sporting events, the entertainment and dining and nightlife, I, I think people will st still place value on that. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But I, I interrupted myself. I started geeking out, of course. What I was going to say is sometimes if more new construction in the suburbs is selling, we know that tends to be bigger product, right? Tends to have more square feet. Your typical existing home might have 1,800 square feet. Your typical new home might have 2,400 or 2,500, or we know some of them have 3,500. So if we are expecting larger homes to sell, of course you'd expect that to bring up prices. But this is why PPSF is so beautiful. We eliminate that size bias. We eliminate the fact that larger homes are going to sell for a higher price. And we counterweight that by looking at price per square foot. I care how much you're paying per square foot. I don't care how many of these you have. We care how much you're paying per foot. Uh, and sure enough, um, values went up, not just the size of home went up, but what people were willing to pay per square foot, regardless of how many square feet, uh, really did go up 15% to about $180 per square foot. Percent of original list price received. This is quite simply the ratio of sold price to list price. up three and a half percent from just about 100 to just about 103 and a half. So at 103.6%, your average seller is getting 100% of their original list price, right? They're getting 100% plus 3.6% because buyers are desperate and there's not much on the market. So we have to offer a little bit over asking uh, if we're going to um, in order to sweeten the deal. We may also have to have no contingencies. We may also have to have an appraisal gap clause. We may also have to bypass inspection. Um, yeah, kind of in an interesting period. So you guys will see, um, never have we been there. Well, maybe I should be careful. Our data only goes back to 03. I have some old North Star uh, mailers uh, from the old days that go back to 1960. Um, I do not believe we've ever been uh, over over 103. The only time I think we were over 100 uh, was last year, and here we are at 103.6. Uh, current, yeah, not as interesting. Let's skip that in the interest of time. Speaking of time, uh, what are we? Okay, 225. I think we're doing okay. So inventory, active listings, very simply. This is a snapshot or a uh, just just a snapshot of the properties that are listed under active status at the end of the month. Last month, we had uh, just about 7,800 properties that were listed under active status. Uh, that's down 23%. It's a pretty far cry from the 37,000 active listings we once had, uh, what, 14 short years ago. Let me offer one note on this, you guys, because I think, well, because it's pretty important. What's happening now? We know that the median days on market is seven days, right? Seven days. So in a market with a median days on market of seven days, a lot of homes are being listed on July 10th and they're going under contract on July 20th, right? Or July 17th, right? Whatever it is, seven, 10, even 15 days. So what does that mean for our inventory methodology, for our calculation? Well, it means you're not gonna show up in inventory. If you were listed on the 10th and you go under contract on the 15th, 20th or 25th, right? Now you're under contract. Now you're in pending status, right? So you're no longer active. However, buyers did have that listing as a, as a choice, as an option. At some point during the month, it just wasn't active at month end. 
Um, so just a couple things to think about there. Month supply, 1.4 months of supply, sort of a ridiculously tight market still. At least we don't have 0.9 months of supply like we did uh, a few short months ago. Obviously, again, a far cry from 11 months. And we've been in a seller's market since 2012, right? Anything under five months of supply is a seller's market. Uh, 4.7 is not a very strong seller's market, but it's a seller's market. Um, you know, one, one and a half months, very, uh, very much a strong seller's market as evidenced by the fact that sellers are getting 103.6% of their original list price. Just thinking this through sellers markets, we just talked about that less than five months of supply, or maybe we should say fewer than five months of supply. Here are some of the other um, you know, uh, hallmarks or trends that go along with a seller's market. Contrast that with a buyer's market, right? Here you have more than six months of supply. Seller's markets, you've got all these buyers competing for a limited number of listings. In a buyer's market, you've actually got a fair number of sellers, but they're competing over a small pool of buyers. So here the sellers have to make concessions, offer to pay seller paids, offer to replace uh, whatever, uh, wood floors, paint, furnace, you know, whatever it is. Um, so that's a very different market. What we'd like to see nine times out of 10 is a balanced market, but this seems ever elusive. So five to six, maybe even four to seven months of supply would be relatively balanced um, where neither side has sort of a market wide advantage. Things are sort of in market equilibrium. We're not leaning toward buyers. We're not leaning toward, uh, toward sellers. You know, I threw in some year to date figures um, and I, I don't think we're gonna do all of them, uh, but so let's just fly through a few. So new listings, we are still up on the year so far, up two and a half percent. You know, we're not, we're not as high as we could be or should be given where demand is, but at least we're not down on the year. Pending sales, also up 7% so far uh, for the year. Uh, 39.8 is higher than 38.7, but is not quite as high as 41.2. What that tells us is 2021 year to date is the second strongest um, year to date, is the second strongest start to the year so far uh, for any year going all the way, uh, going all the way back to 03, second only behind 05. We know that's a bubble year and not all of these signed contracts closed, right? We know that for a fact. Uh, some were condos, some, uh, it was a little bit of a frothy market. So a very different, uh, a very different time period. Ah, here's an interesting one. So July year to date closings in the Metro. So here we're up nine and a half percent on the year to 36 one, higher, higher. Ooh, so here we are first place for closings. Um, so far, 2021 is the strongest year of any year for closings going all the way back to 2003. Demand is stronger this year between, between January and July uh, than it was for that period for any year um, over the last, um, over the last uh, 18 years. So pretty, uh, pretty impressive uh, high watermark, if you will. All right, market times year to date instead of seven, more like nine, not much else to say there. Um, year to date median sales price instead of 350, more like 336, because in the winter months of January and February, we know that we've got slightly more affordable product that sells. Percentage of original instead of 1036 for the year, we're at 1028. And now let's shift gears a bit. Uh, let's talk about some other unique market indicators. Uh, and you know what? Let's do a quick check of any questions, and I see none. Okay. All right, so some other unique market indicators. So uh, percentage of active listings under a quarter million. Uh, we lovingly call this a disappearing act. So we're looking at St. Paul in red, Minneapolis in blue, and then the whole 16 county um, metro area uh, here in gray. Looks like our friends in St. Paul um, flatlined a little bit. So they hung on to their share under 250 and then it's been declining, but it's still 53% of all actives. Our friends in Minneapolis are experiencing something a little bit different. They're actually seeing an increase in the number of homes uh, in the number of actives under 250. You know, I was thinking of reasons for this. A few, a few come to mind. Maybe some of that is condos. Anything under 250, I think has a slightly higher likelihood of being a condo. Um, I also think you have some of these sellers who wished to sell last year, who just weren't ready for whatever reason, um, who are now kind of coming online. So maybe, maybe there's that um, pent up demand to list. 
Um, and also, I think that a lot of Minneapolis homes are a little bit older and a little bit smaller. Uh, so um, as you see folks giving those up in favor of maybe larger product, either in the city or elsewhere, um, perhaps you can see a little bit of an increase there as well. Okay, let's look at momentum, price momentum. I kind of like this one. Well, I like all of these, if you didn't know. Year over year change in median sales price, guys, uh, going all the way back to 04. Um, so uh, where to begin? Um, well, you see a pretty solid price gains in 04, 05. Then we had the Great Recession and we saw some price declines. We had that tax credit period that was sort of this temporary uh, ephemeral period of stabilization. Then you see phase one of recovery where we had pretty, pretty substantial price gain, um, uh, almost 18%. And then we settled into the more mature phases of recovery, right? And then something happened, right? And we know what happened. Uh, it was a pandemic. Uh, and you guys can see suddenly prices started rising um, consistently at 10% plus for the last year, right? Sometimes even at 16 and a half percent, which almost rivals, right? The, the 17, 18% gains that we saw just as we were getting out of the great recession. So uh, July was, uh, what was it? 14, I think it was 14.5 or 14.8. June was 16.6. You know, with prices rising at 16.6 and 14.8% over the last two months, you know, if you ask me if I think the market's crashing, you know, I, I would say no, um, just based on prices, but also sales as we saw. So urban market share, again, a little bit different, but let's take a look at the percentage of metro-wide sales that are taking place in Minneapolis or St. Paul. Obviously you can't take, you can't have a sale in both of those cities on one listing. You're kind of either on one side or the other of the, uh, of the border. April of last year, I've marked that in yellow. You guys can see the pullback in urban market share after um, COVID, the health concerns, you know, perhaps some of the unrest last year. And then look at what happened. I think, I think people are surprised to, to learn this that actually we've seen growth in the number of sales happening in either of our beautiful core cities. We've seen an increase in share. It's actually fairly substantial. So here, um, remember, that was when we had our condo bubble. Remember that? Uh, 08, 09, a lot of condos, a lot of downtown. Um, we had this kind of back to the city urban renaissance. I don't know if I'm ready to call it that again yet, but we do see people um, who are eager to reinvest in the city and, and who are um, who are making moves, um, either staying within or coming in or, or moving around the city. Ah, yes, this is uh, an oldie but a goodie. Um, this one looks at percentage of sales with a price reduction. So this is July, and it's every July of every year going back to 2003. What do we notice? Things look kind of rough around here, right? We're 48%, 40, 45 to call it, call it 45 to 49% of our sales had to have a price reduction. So, so almost half had to have a price reduction. Where are we at this year? 15%, right? 15% of our sales required a price reduction. That's not very many, right? In fact, it's the lowest it's been in 18 years. Interesting trend happening. Um, Again, maybe we're reading a little bit too much into it, but perhaps this indicator was just starting to do an about face, kind of turn around maybe a little bit. Hard to say for sure, but we went from 22.2 to 22.4 up to 23. So perhaps things were starting to turn just a little bit, hard to say. Um, and again, it's just a July. So maybe it was a really hot month or a less hot month or more people went out, you know, on vacation on the fourth, you know, I don't know, uh, lots of different, uh, lots of different theories there. Ah, uh, yes, I told you we were looking at some other alternative indicators, and uh, I hope I'm holding up my end of the bargain. Median square footage of closed sales. How about this one, huh? I think so. So take a look, what happened last year? Wow, people really did want more space. Right, so look at the trend, look at the growth trend in square footage. 
So we've gone from 1680 up to 1880. Um, so what is that? 200 square feet over 18 years. Um, so what is that? 10, 12 square feet a year. You know, I, it's not, it's not a ton. Um, remember though, uh, new construction tends to be bigger. Uh, and, uh, a lot of move up buyers obviously tend to buy new homes and the smaller, more affordable homes that are, you know, that are, you know, 14, 15, 1600, they aren't really being listed, right? Because I'm not, if I have it and I like my payment and I like where I am, I'm not going to sell it because I probably can't find anything at that payment in a similar location for a similar quality and condition and so on. So uh, fascinating here. Uh, we've come down a little bit, um, but sure enough, people were looking uh, to add some square footage last year. Home office, home classroom, bonus room, playroom for the kids, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> saw another trend uh, the other day. I read about it uh, increasingly. The, I think it was the National Association for the Remodeling Industry. And they said this a couple of years ago, but they said increasingly, um, builders are being asked to build uh, two master bedrooms and someone said that's the secret to a happy marriage is two master bedrooms. Um, although obviously that word master and that and the word landlord um, have some negative connotations. So um, some people are looking at making a change there to be more inclusive. So again, we definitely see that pattern um, with more sales activity uh, uh, in some of these higher, uh, higher square footage ranges. How about we look at new construction and previously owned square footage? So not much excitement in previously owned. For new construction though, right, it got really big into 2015 and 16. And then I think consumers started moaning about prices a little bit. And builders said one way to reach a more attractive price point um, is to control size. So we saw sizes, you know, kind of come back down to 2,300, down from maybe 26, 2,700. Um, and then interestingly, we did see a little bit of an uptick here uh, you know, in, in, you know, in the COVID market last year where people did want some extra space for the reasons uh, we talked about. All right, luxury. Let's spend just a minute or two talking luxury, uh, 2.40. I think we're doing okay on time. So close sales, um, it, you know, I keep, I got to fix this, you guys. Let me make a note. It's at or above, at or above. Okay. Close sales, um, at or above a million. 137 of them so far, excuse me, not so far this year, 137 of them in July. Uh, that's up about 25%. So that's about a quarter more than um, than last year. And you know, even if you look at the bubble, looks like I guess 04 at 53 was the hottest July sort of in that bubble period, or it, it maybe 04 is a lead up to the bubble period. Um, 53, right? We're almost three times that. Um, we're almost three times that. So that's July. I jumped the gun on year to date. Uh, and here again, you guys, this is interesting. Um, so let's spend again, just kind of 20 seconds talking about it. So 2020 year to date. So basically first half of the year saw uh, also a 25, 26% increase in million plus sales um, to just under a thousand. Um, right. Uh, just almost, in fact, exactly um, double uh, what we saw in 05, right? 480, uh, almost, almost perfectly uh, double that. Uh, and, you know, 200 more from the year prior. Now, some of you are probably looking at this number, um, down 17 and a half percent, down to 791. This is an exceptional number, right? This is a unique number. I won't say it wasn't real. It was real. But remember, those that had the wherewithal to make a move last year, did make a move last year. Those who had the privilege or the luxury of buying a pro buying a home with uh, an extra home classroom, a new uh, a home office, two home offices if there are two working, uh, if there are two working uh, spouses or partners in the household. Um, if you're on a call, it's hard to be in the same home office with someone when you're both on calls. That that doesn't always work well. So you know we are still above 2019 levels, 761 up 30 to 791. So that's encouraging, but yes, we struggled to reach um, that sort of elevated baseline level. So this is kind of a pie in the sky, and it's because last year was exceptional for reasons um, we don't have to keep repeating. 
let's dive a little deeper into some of our affordability uh, trends and other dynamics. And I will also include, I hope you guys will like this, I'll also include some aggregate um, local market performance trends. We'll ask the question, what percentage of markets had increases in new listings? What percentage of markets had rising prices? Um, so on and so forth. So I think you guys will get a kick out of it. Okay, price to income ratio. We've shown this one a few times. Um, so 2.9 is our high watermark um, during the bubble. And sure enough, we see ourselves at 2.9 again. So three to one. So income of about 103,000 for a household compared to that 2020 price of about 305, we have to go out and spend roughly three times our income to get the median priced home. I'll say that again, uh, the typical, or I should say the median earning household has to go out and spend roughly three times their pre-tax income on a house, three times. That may sound like a lot to some of you, <laughs> but let's look at the price to income ratios of a variety of metro areas. How about our friends in the Bay Area, nine to one? Um, this depends on when we look at the data and what um, income figure we use. Sometimes we use per capita income, uh, median family income or median household income. So there's a couple different ways to do this. I know in some ways, I think it's actually like 12 to one, um, the, the price to income ratio. And the math on that is I think about 1.6 million to 120,000 in income. Los Angeles, San Diego, Miami, Seattle, you can see uh, as we go down the list, uh, see Phoenix and Charlotte and uh, Houston. And there we are, right? Um, Twin Cities, again, this is not the same 2.9. This is a different methodology um, from some of the NAR data. But when you look at it, right, we're lower than a lot of these other cities. And, you know, no, we are not in LA. However, you know, a, a Portland, kind of a Boston, maybe a Denver, probably not quite a Seattle, um, not a Chicago, a little different than Houston. Charlotte, I know, is, you know, pretty similar to us in terms of economic makeup and population size and whatnot. Uh, and so just so you guys know, three to one may seem high. The reality is compared to other um, sister cities or peer cities, um, we're actually doing quite well. Ah, yes, the great mean reversion. Uh, this is a popular one. We get asked about this one quite a bit. It goes all the way back to 1960. And what we're seeing in blue is actual reported or recorded average sales price. Take a peek at 04, 05, 06. Look at that average sales price, right? You can really see the bubble. What happened as we came into 2011 uh, and 2012? You can see the crash, right? There was the party. There was the hangover. What do we notice now? Um, I've put sort of upper and lower bounds on this chart. So the average is 5.4 uh, going back to 1960. So what I wanted to do is do 5.3 just below and 5.5 just above. And this allows us a little wiggle room um, just to kind of see how we're faring and to assess whether we're in that channel. That's our long-term growth um, trajectory. Sometimes we've been under trend, right? Sometimes we've been over trend and then back under trend. And that's why it's a trend. We've kind of been on either side of it. And sure enough, guys, uh, take a peek at this. Our actual sales price last year, we don't have all of this year's data, obviously. Um, it's actually below the channel, meaning We've still got some runway ahead of us in terms of pricing. We've got some room to run. We are not yet right above that trend. Now, you know, up here, <laughs> I think people should have started to ask, do we have a lot more room to run? Because we're well above this trend. So, you know, how much longer can this really go on? By the way, once we take out inflation, you're about 1.8%. So just about 2% per year. I know you guys have probably been saying that to your clients for some of you for, for decades. I didn't take a look at everyone on today, uh, but I, I, I know that that's been a, a, um, that's been a popular um, assessment, uh, about 2% per year. And sure enough, guys, uh, inflation is about 3%. So, you know, call it five down to two-ish. There's your roughly 3%, 3.5%-ish. Okay, uh, Metro market activity. Again, a little bit of a historical look, um, 1967 uh, through 2020. New listings in blue, closed sales in orange. Wow, look at supply here. Supply got way higher than demand there in the late 80s. And I think there was a 91 recession. 
And then look, uh, look what happened to seller activity compared to buyer activity. We had a buildup in new listings, which became especially problematic when demand fell. Who's going to buy all these listings? Nobody, right? We had to cancel, they expired, we had to fire sale them, they went short sale, we had to have price reductions. Uh, sometimes the plug was pulled on condo projects entirely. Um, what do we see now? We see seller activity and buyer activity really tight, right? We don't see this huge yawning gap um, like we did here. That's a concerning gap because it says we're having a supply buildup, but buyers aren't purchasing that supply. Now we see that sales are so strong, but sellers aren't really fueling that demand. So here, buyers weren't absorbing that supply. Here, sellers aren't fueling that demand. So we really kind of are, you know, in an opposite, uh, where we're really in an opposite type of landscape now. And the fact that supply and demand are so tight, right? This is why prices are rising. Uh, the few times we've seen uh, supply and demand uh, very tight, that's when you tend to see um, the most robust price appreciation. Okay, as promised, let's take a look at the percent of local markets with year over year rising new listings. So year over year gains in new listings, and this is for July. Um, so this is for all of our reporting areas. Forgive me, you guys, I, I, it should say reporting areas. Um, so that's major cities, right? None of the small, tiny townships with zero or one sale. Um, this is our major markets, right? The Egan's Apple Valleys, Maple Groves, uh, Bloomingtons, uh, Woodberries, um, you know, uh, most of the big ones around town. So, so, so for July of this year, 51% of our markets had um, increases in new listings. In 2013, it was 76%. Right, so you know, not a ton to write home about there. How about uh, what percent of our markets had gains in closed sales? Well, last July was fifty-eight percent. This July, it's a little bit more like thirty-eight and a half percent. So there is a difference there. Now, some of you may be wondering, well, then why wouldn't we see a decline in closed sales? Well, probably because Minneapolis and St. Paul could have been, and Bloomington, some of the larger cities could have had gains. And that's going to skew the metric higher overall, even though more markets might have lost. Some of those markets may only have 5, 10, 20 closed sales instead of hundreds, um, instead of hundreds. So just a little note there. This is a pretty uh, convincing one, if you ask me, percentage of local markets with year over year price gains. 83%. That's the strongest we've seen since uh, 04. So 83.5% of our local markets, um, by the way, all the markets in our local market updates, if you go to our website, um, everything in that local market updates page, 83.5% um, of those local markets experienced price gains last month, right? That's how we say that. Um, how about rising price per square foot? We already talked about why that's important and 93% um, had gains and not just because of the, the larger size of home selling, but because of more value placed on each square foot of house if that makes sense. So 93%, very strong figure, um, strongest figure we've seen since July of 04. Uh, another very convincing one, no mistake here, guys. Uh, what's the percent of local markets that had increases in CDOM, right? Uh, so how many of our local markets had uh, increasing market times? <laughs> Only four and a half percent, right? Only four and a half percent of local markets had um, rising days on market. No surprise, it's a tight market. Uh, market times are, are fast and they're falling. And so no surprise that only four or 5% had uh, gains in market times. How about this one? Local markets with uh, uh, an increase in percent of original list price. So again, this is that ratio of sold price to list price. Uh, and so we're asking how many of our local markets had gains uh, in terms of what sellers are accepting, 90%, guys, 89%. Highest figure since 04 once again. Um, so a pretty, strong, um, a pretty strong stat there. Let's shift gears um, and just do a quick forecast and look at some interest rates before we um, talk about um, the value and, and look at some other interesting, um, interesting indicators. So 2021 price forecast. Here's the MBA. In January, they thought 5%. Right, but now 
they, they doubled that. They're thinking about 10, uh, about 10, 10 and a third. Uh, Fanny, uh, 4.2 up to eight, also just about doubled it. Zellman, six to seven, so not quite as, um, as uh, bullish. And then uh, Freddie, uh, Freddie 5.3 to 6.6. And then NAR, six to 6.6. So not huge gains here, but these two guys definitely had large gains. Overall, people used to be thinking five and a third. Maybe now they're thinking seven and a half, seven and three quarters. Here again, we've got a few others here. Uh, we've thrown in CoreLogic here and Realtor.com. So 2021 price forecasts, about 6% across the board, which is right in the middle of, the, uh, of, our, other, um, of our other forecast table. MBA, there they are at 10.3. There's CoreLogic at 3%. Uh, and so overall, expect about 5, 6, 7%, which is just what we saw. How about mortgage rates? Um, Freddie, Fannie, uh, the mortgage bankers, and then the uh, National Association of Realtors. So for uh, second quarter of this year, they were thinking 2.93. That was actually really close. For third quarter, they're thinking 3.03, so up a tenth uh, of a percent, up 10 bips. Uh, 2021 fourth quarter, they're thinking not even 3.1. And then by, say, you know February or March of next year, they're thinking about 3.0 almost 3.2. So no one's really expecting huge gains on the rate side of things. Um, here we are with the 30 year fixed at 2.86%. Guys, I remember a couple of years ago when rates went actually, well, this was, this was long time. Actually, this was eight years ago. Sorry, seven years ago. I think it was 2013 or 14. The first time rates went below 4%. Um, you know, people were like, oh my God, this is a historic time. And now we're below 3%. But we used to be at 2.67. So now we're at 2.87 or so. And I bet there's people saying 2.87, that is a ridiculously high rate because I just saw 2.67. You can't make this stuff up, you guys. Uh, I had one important note there, guys. I, I didn't want to skip over that. Prices are rising, yes, but payments really aren't rising that much. Why? Rates lower interest rates have the power to offset rising monthly costs brought on by rising prices. Let me say that again. Interest rates can be a counterbalancing force to rising prices because people care more about monthly payment than they do about the actual home price, right? The price doesn't really matter to me as long as I can afford that monthly payment. So we are in a monthly payment business and I, that's really how we ought to think about it. Of all these buyers that are flooding the market, are you guys concerned? I'm not. Here's why. Let's take a look at the quality of those buyers. Mortgage originations by credit score. Ooh, good one. So here's our um, pretty high risk borrowers with uh, under 620 credit scores. Here's our highly qualified borrowers with 760 plus credit scores. <laughs> what do we see happening 03, 04, 05, 06? A lot of these high-risk borrowers um, entered the marketplace. We had adjustable rate mortgages. We had all sorts of exotic loan vehicles, ninja loans, um, you know, to get them qualified. If you can fog a mirror, you can get a mortgage. How about now? Those high-risk borrowers have virtually disappeared from the market. Who's flooded in? It's our highly, highly, highly qualified buyers. Look at our 760 plus. Look at virtually all the gain has been by way of highly qualified borrowers and buyers. Um, so I think that's an important note to make. Okay, guys, we're starting to round third base here. Let's do another time check. Oh, gosh, three minutes. Okay. Applications. How do I use this stuff? What's in it for me? Believe it or not, stats can answer popular questions, right? Are we in a buyer's market or a seller's market? Month supply can tell you that, right? We talked about it. How do property types compare? Well, townhouse condo versus single family. We can break it out. Are prices rising or falling? We've got median sales price. How long will it take to sell my home? We've got days on market. How much of my asking price will I receive? We've got percent of original list price, right? What's happening with new construction? We've got it. How about foreclosures? We have it, meaning you guys have it, right? So be the expert you wish to see in the market. All right, a little cheesy, but work with me here. So how will this benefit you? 
listing presentations, opens, showings, right? You're doing some prospecting, lead gen, lead capture. How about personal marketing? It's you versus the market. The median days on market in Adina is 37 days. However, my market time in Adina is 21. I can sell your home faster and I can prove it, right? Use stats to prove that you are better than the competition. How about managing expectations? I've got that, you know, I've got that St. Louis Park seller who thinks their 1,600 square foot tutor is worth uh, is worth 450,000. It's probably worth 350 to be fair, but not 450. Um, so you know, it's worth um, kind of understanding those market realities and managing expectations. You guys can see uh, so on and so forth here. You know, I want to point out as we do, I want to point out um, our market data page because. We've made some changes to it and it's really uh, looking great and spiffy. So we encourage you guys to uh, take a look. And with that, I will stop in the name of love or the name of stats and turn it back over to my friend and colleague, Anne. Thank you, David. Great presentation right. as always. I can give a minute here. If anybody does have any questions that they want answered, feel free to send them over now. Otherwise, this recording and the slides will be sent out via email as well as available on the market data page of our website. So thank you guys all for joining and we hope to see you next month at the August monthly housing update. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, David.